Okay, well, come back after the break. And now we are moving on to the second section of the day, and which will focus on, on uh, banking and also on all the climate pledges and basically how we move from all the pledges and commitments to the action. Because we have seen many pledges and many commitments and targets over the past, let's say, five years, maybe 10 years on uh, when it comes to climate climate targets when it comes to environmental targets and we know that now some of them are made for 2030 some for 2050 but in any case we are needing some of the deadlines now i'm really curious to hear what um, what the next two speakers in the elevator speeches but also then the panel in the panel discussion have to say about it and how we can actually material some materialize some of these some of these targets and how can we actually uh, bring about the action so now, we will now start with two, as we call them, elevator speeches, so short, uh, energetic, and uh, um, very uh, punchy presentations. So we will start with David Carlin, who's the head of climate risk and TCFD program lead at UNEP, UNEP FI. So David, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, th thank you so much. It's, it's great to be here uh, and very much looking forward to, uh, to speaking with you today. And I'll really just make a few remarks, but in the context of what is an expanding field of climate data and, and why it matters to the work that we all do, whether we're working directly on sustainability, whether we're thinking about financing opportunities, or from a governmental standpoint, the commitments that firms are making and other governments are making. And so to begin, I, I think that there are three big themes that, that I'll come to, which is one is the element of imperfect information, which is, to me, the heart of finance as well as the heart of risk. When we think about the future, we know that we're always going to be dealing with uncertainty. We know that we're always going to be looking at a field of vision where we're not necessarily fully able to consider all of the different impacts. And in fact, over the last years, we've realized that despite having good tools, having good information, we miss a lot of the key concerns. We obviously saw this in the global financial crisis when we had reams of information, but it wasn't properly considering the, the level of risk exposed. And now we see this again, despite the fact that we've put in improved regimes of assessment, better statistical modeling capabilities. We saw in the world of rising rates, the fact that ultimately what happened was in the US as well as in Europe, a number of banks have seen significant mismatches in their, their investment portfolios and have been forced to take significant losses as that became apparent to the market. So the key here is not to say that the information, the analysis, the assessments that we do are useless, but it is to say that we should approach this with a degree of humility and a degree of recognizing that finance begins with the idea of uncertainty and this idea that maybe we are making a prediction about the future anytime we make a loan, anytime we make an investment, anytime we underwrite something. And so as a result, we are operating in that world where our blinders are on. And I think the key is to find data, to use data in ways that reveal a little bit more of the operating space to us. We're never going to get to that full view of the future because there are always going to be things that we miss and always going to be things that we don't fully consider. However, I think it's important to recognize, though, when it comes to that uncertainty, where we are with climate is a bit of a unique challenge because fundamentally climate is what I would call, from a statistical standpoint, a badly behaved problem. It's one that really demands that what we look at in the past and what we look at in the future are two fundamentally different things. So how do we draw lessons from the past in terms of previous physical events, in terms of loss rates, in terms of impacts, how do we draw that when we're really struggling with the idea that the whole premise of climate change is that that future is going to not look like the past, that there are going to be relationships that strengthen, relationships that weaken, relationships that fundamentally break down. And I think this is really where the heart of climate data comes in, which is to say, can it provide us with this view of safety? Can it provide us with a barrier and a view of resilience for our assets, for our portfolios, and for those of our clients to really think more extensively about the risks. And so rather than, I think, the very tunnel-focused work, which we've seen a lot of in the data space over the last few years of, can we get 
for every geolocated asset a view on the particular factors that are going to be climate sensitive. Can we think about data more in the sense of a holistic view of where are our uncertainties? And if we're not certain where the risks are going to come, what are the things that are going to be protective? What are the things that are going to help us? The analogy I often like to give about this is we're driving on the highway. We don't just decide to buckle our seatbelt when we're about to get in a crash. We recognize the seatbelt protects us from worse outcomes, despite the fact that we don't know when an accident may happen. And I think that that's kind of the fundamental idea here of climate data is where might there be risks that we may have missed? Where might there be information that we might not have covered? And then can we use climate data to open our eyes to more structured thinking about where we need to be preparing and where we need to be thinking about those contingencies? So I think the best initial uses of climate data begin with this idea of helping us see things that we haven't otherwise seen. And that kind of gets into the, the second theme, which is what is the use of climate data? What is useful data really look like? And I think useful data gets back to that old adage about all models being wrong, but some being useful. And in this case, the idea here is we know, as I said, that all predictions about the future will be wrong in some way. But the ones that are going to be useful are the ones that are going to be able to shape our future decisions, that are going to leave us better prepared for the future, and importantly, are going to help change the way that we think. They're going to do that either by showing us something we would have otherwise missed, or instead by showing us something that we had an inkling of or a hypothesis, and this helps to confirm or disconfirm that. And so when I think about the data that is used on the risk side, but also on financed emissions, what I'm really trying to get at and what I'm trying to, to express here is this notion that the most useful data is going to be something that tells us something that we don't know or helps us confirm or disconfirm something that we were thinking toward. And so when we consider the models we build, when we consider the information we have, we don't want to get to data for data's sake. We want to get to data for a clear use for a real purpose. And I think that that is really widening our perspective of the world. I think we naturally walk around with blinders. We look at the past, and we look at the present, and we assume that change happens in a linear and slow way. And yet we have countless examples from COVID to rising inflation now to the conflict in Ukraine of the potential near-term perspectives being a lot broader than we actually had anticipated. And I think the value of good data, of good information, isn't to get into these sort of high-tech discussions of how this supply chain 3,000 miles away is operating. That is useful, but I think in a broader conceptualization, it's to say, what are the key indicators? We need to be able to digest and use this data to draw insights that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to make. And I think those insights in the case of climate look like potentially where are systems shifting from one mode to another? So where is climate action strengthening and the transition heating up? Where are there potentials for risks to really emerge on the physical side? How do interrelationships between these risks exist? And so this, to me, really moves into kind of the third area that I would say, which is making us active users of this information. It's not about collecting data. It's not about gathering this information simply for the fact that we can put it in a report, simply for the fact that we feel better informed when we have it. It's really only what we do with it. And I think the main uses of this information, whether it's on the risk side or the opportunity side, really boil down to how does this influence your decisions? So what I often talk about with people is this sort of transmission mechanism of here's a climate-related shock or a transition-related shock. How does that flow through into the companies that you finance, into the counterparties that you have? And where does that show up in terms of the credit risks and market risks that you may experience? And I think that fundamental translation is going from what is the magnitude of that shock? How might it translate into things such as changes in revenues, impacts to overall outlook for the industry, changes in potential compliance costs that an organization might face. We see in the US just now, the US EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, is making a requirement around power plants and, and their carbon emissions. What is that going to do to the competitiveness of certain fossil assets? I think these are the kinds of questions where data can be useful without us saying at an individual level, we have all of the pieces we need. We can begin acting by saying, 
if then. And by really focusing that, that premise of the data on the links between climate-related, transition-related shocks, and the impacts on the real economy. And then many of us have the models already in existence to think about how those shocks on the real economy, on real companies, flows through into our portfolios. And one of the questions here is not only for us to understand how it flows through, but also to realize where our architecture needs to be updated. Are there elements that are climate sensitive that are not being taken into account in your risk ratings, in your risk appetite, in the way you're engaging with clients? And so in thinking about this, both to spot the opportunities and also to manage the downside risks, and importantly, to help companies to make their transitions, one of the keys is really thinking about what information do I need to make a decision? And that gets back to this real point, which is thinking about what is the decision useful criteria? Where are the elements where you could be flying a little bit less blind with information? And I think, as I said at the beginning, it's not about information for information's sake. It's really about focusing on where this plugs in to a risk score, where this plugs into a valuation model. And understanding these relationships, there's quite a lot of work both being done in the academic space as well as empirically between relationships between climate policy and valuation of companies, between how markets are assessing and evaluating the long-term viability of certain sectors. These are pieces of information that can help us build those links. And so I really would recommend for all of us in the audience to be active users of this information and to recognize that we are doing a challenging thing here of trying to fix the engine while we're on that highway. We are trying to move towards sustainability. We're trying to get to the heart of decarbonization and building a sustainable future. But the only way we're going to do that is to recognize that in the face of these uncertainties, we need to be collecting data. If data can be that useful engine, it's an engine that needs to be operating even as we're moving along the road. And so what I would really recommend as main takeaways for you here in thinking about the uses of data, the applications of it in the climate space are first off to consider how it's being used within your organization. If you don't have a clear use for it, then thinking about either is that a failure on the data, self, the data side itself? It's not useful, it's not impactful data. Or on the process side, do you not have a way to ingest that? Secondly, I would think about how does this data change the relationships you have strategically and then tactically with the clients that you work with? What information is helpful to assess transitions, to assess opportunities, to manage the risks that clients are facing? And then finally, I think, and this is one of the more exciting spaces of data, how can data tell us things, give us insights that we otherwise wouldn't have? And this is where the space of machine learning, AI, that we've seen so much about in the popular press, really links back into this question of climate and sustainability, which is all of these tools can be very valuable, but they can only be valuable if they're going to help us provide insights into things that we don't already understand or help us confirm or disconfirm patterns that we are already seeing. And so without that, this sort of undirected view of data, the collection for collection's sake, is going to leave us in a place where we have a huge stack of data and limited action. We're in a world that not only is generating more data than ever before, but it also is moving and changing faster than ever before. And I think our challenge and the, the push I would give to all of you here is to recognize that this is a simultaneous process of getting the information you need and applying it. And it's those two things together that are going to make your institution more effective, more resilient, and getting to the heart of sustainability. Sustainability is not just about the overall global society, but organizationally, sustainability means that you will be around for the future, means that you will be able to weather challenges in this changing world, whether they be environmental or not. And so when I think about data as the heart of sustainability, it's about using this data bringing it in and having processes in place for that continuous improvement, even as we go along this road that we're all following at rapid pace. So thank you and very much looking forward to hearing the rest of the session. And thank you very much, David. And thank you so much for a lot of food for thought as well. And also touching some of these, um, some of the topics we actually already opened yesterday. I'm really, really glad we brought the data perspective to this too, because that resonated a lot yesterday in the discussion about ESG ratings and how it's not only collecting data for the sake of data, but also 
actually looking for that purpose and how to use it and how to apply it practically for solutions. Um, and now we will move to the second second uh, elevator speech, which will focus on fixed income and debt, and will be delivered by Ulf Erlandson, who's the founder and CEO of the Anthropocene Fixed Income Institute. <sighs> yes, Ulf, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <coughs> Impressive. Uh, pronunciation of uh, the Anthropocene Fixed Income Institute, which I founded uh, three years ago, and which is a very um, organization very much focused on exactly what David was talking about, you know, the transmission mechanism. We have the data, we have the knowledge, but how does it actually apply in terms of what happens on a day-to-day -day basis uh, for fixed income portfolio managers? And uh, the picture that we're using for our uh, sort of brand, the sprouts coming out of the Bloomberg keyboard, reflects this. The capital allocation decisions in fixed income markets, they are done through the Bloomberg terminal. That's where you actually trade, buy and sell securities that eventually then uh, shift the cost of capital towards a more sustainable future. Uh, given the short attention span of uh, portfolio managers, uh, I have developed a way to put QR codes in the presentation, and it's extremely hard to spell our organization's name. Um, so uh, please feel free to use those. Uh, they will be referencing a couple of the research pieces that I will be mentioning here. To kick off, um, leveraging fixed income for positive impact. Why? I will actually start out with saying that uh, there was a gentleman yesterday suggesting that ESG investment is pretty much meaningless. If I sell a bad asset, someone else buys it, and it doesn't really matter for the company. That is fundamentally wrong, at least if you look at fixed income. Fixed income is predominantly what we call a primary market relative to equities, which is predominantly a secondary market. In the primary market, for example, an issuer is looking to raise capital. They go out to investors, and investors say, we are going to lend you money or not lend you money. And if there are fewer investors lending you money, you are going to have to pay a higher rate on that loan in order to incentivize them. It drives cost of capital directly in fixed income. ESG investment, exclusion rules, all of those things actually apply in fixed income, whereas the argument is less strong in equities. Secondly, the reach of fixed income is much broader than in equities. We, or the portfolio managers, the CIOs, and the fixed income books, they speak to everyone. They speak to the EIB, they speak to governments, they speak to private companies, they speak to all these different outfits across the financial biotope, whereas the equity, by definition, is focused on public equity companies. And especially when you're looking at the energy transition and some of the issues that's going on there, the non-public entities are the big important players, especially if you want to manage your things such as your uh, carbon footprint. And this brings us to the third part where, you know, activist fixed income investors have historically been shown to transform complete economic systems. Think about the European sovereign uh, crisis in the 10s. It was fixed income investors, actually hedge funds, starting to short certain securities on the back of fundamentally non-sustainable macroeconomic policies, debt situations that were untenable. And by moving interest rates, by selling bonds such that interest, rate, interest rates moved up, people were or a whole system, the European Union had to, or the Eurozone, had to change their view on macroeconomic policy. That is powerful. So how do we leverage and get that to actually work with, it, with regards to climate? It already is working, actually. I am exemplifying two things here. Uh, number one is a letter for, to shareholders from SEMCORP, a Singaporean sort of infrastructure conglomerate which is essentially saying that we have this coal asset, we're trying to sell it, but no one is providing finance to the guys who want to buy it, which was a private Omani uh, consortium, by the way. Um, so we have to provide the financing instead. They were unable to find public fi finance for a particular coal project. On the right-hand side, and it's going to be extremely hard to look at you, so I'll, I'll, I'll color code it over here. We have in green Saudi Aramco, uh, and over here we have fixed income investors in 
a vehicle called Green Scythe, or Green Sword, if you translate it. Green Scythe is a special purpose vehicle from Luxembourg, which is working as a financing vehicle for uh, a Saudi Aramco's pipeline uh, uh, network set up through a private, uh, private consortium. Now, wouldn't it be easier for Saudi Aramco to actually borrow money straight out rather than go through this sort of very convoluted green safe structure? No. It turns out that Saudi Aramco, for many of the ESG indices, is excluded because they're not scoring well enough on certain factors. Whereas, if you can restructure this and get it into the green side structure, you can put those bonds into the ESG indices and people will buy them. And you access a lower cost of capital and perhaps also better sort of reputational financing. On the positive side, and fixed income people are generally very depressing because you know, you're sitting there, you're hoping to get your money paid back, you can clip a couple of coupons, and on the other side, you can lose all of your money. That's the sort of the risk return profile, whereas equity investors, they can you know, make 10,000% on their smart Tesla bet or whatever. So we are generally depressing, but this is the one thing that excites me uh, when it comes to transition, so say sustainability-linked bonds. Um, which is a way to put in a conditionality in a loan, in a bond structure, to say that if you achieve certain performance targets with regards to sustainability or something else, um, you are um, um, getting a lower interest rate. You're not getting a stepped-up interest rate. But what's interesting is that these are general corporate purpose instruments. They affect the whole balance sheet. They're not trying to sort of uh, asset back some part of the balance sheet. They're looking at the whole balance sheet of a company. So you get a holistic view of the company. And it's been very effective in terms of actually reaching smaller companies that don't have as much assets um, to put them into green bond structures, also lower rated uh, uh, companies. and. Um, the market is actually working okay-ish. Um, it's not great, but it's working okay-ish. And we had a case discussed yet yesterday, uh, uh, the Polish oil company, uh, PKN Orlen, who were the first in the market to actually not achieve their performance targets and hence pay a step up on that coupon, which is an essential feature of this, this, uh, of this market, that this sort of step up uh, option actually uh, works. And why is that? Well. We've done some work, and this is a, 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 a more of a technical paper, but it is, I think, a fundamentally important idea about where uh, SLBs need, need to go. We call them uh, greenback SLBs, and greenback as in a dollar, and a dollar as in the option premium in an SLB needs to be at least one dollar. Oh, that, that sounds like a lot of theory, um, but that's a nice thing, because this is driving a couple of interesting results out of economic theory or financial theory, rather than trying to you know, play some sort of non-pecuniary uh, soft angle on why people should buy it. So what's going on? In a step-up bond, the investor might get the step-up in the future. So they have like an expected value uh, to this step-up. There's you know, an expected value of the option of having the coupon step-up. That's going to materialize with some probability that we can discuss uh, what that probability is going to be. But what we're seeing in the Greenback SLB proposal is that that optionality, if we assume a 50% step probability, has to be at least $1. If it's not worth $1, so 1% 1 of bond price, why should we bother if it's non-material? I mean, the, the, your traditional fixed income portfolio manager, they, they, they won't react on this because it's not enough meat there in order to, material, uh, to, to analyze it. The flip side of this is also that if the issuers are offering this optionality, well, they're supposed to get the lower coupon, a lower fixed coupon on their SLB. They're supposed to get the lower cost of capital. So if you are offering optionality to investors, you should have something in return as an issuer. And that's the fundamental problem that we've seen in the sort of the, the label bond market, that it hasn't really given you like that boost in terms of lower cost of capital for, for, for the issuer side. The last thing which is exciting about this is that one way to increase optionality is to increase ambition level of the sustainability targets. If you're more ambitious, then there is a higher likelihood of failure. It's, you know, you're more likely to fail trying going for the Olympic gold than you're when you're going for the, you know, the district uh, championship. But we want that ambition, right? And investors want that ambition. So 
that means that the probability of the step up happening is increasing, the optionality is increasing, which means that the ambition level should then be reflected in a lower fixed coupon on the sustainability linked financing. So the more ambitious you are, the lower your interest rate. And that's just from a no arbitrage condition. We're not talking about any sort of uh, a green wizardry here. And you can start pricing that and so on. Uh, uh, we're more than happy to engage and discuss with people who, who would like to look into the, these structures. Investors are excited about it, some banks as well. Um, we're talking about, about banks in this session, so I also want to highlight some of the work that we've been doing. We've been looking at, you know, the banks have a central role in terms of, you know, providing transition finance. And one way to parameterize that is to say, okay, how much do you do in terms of green and sustainability linked financing? And how much do you do in terms of, you know, fossil fuel related financing? And let's net those numbers and normalize it so JP Morgan doesn't look worst or best because they're always the biggest. And this is the resultant list where you'll see the one, two, three, four, five, sixth column gives the headline number, the net that banks are generating in terms of their fee intake from um, uh, green versus uh, fossil, fossil funding activities. So you get the ranking, which banks seem to be generating more business and, and money from the good versus the less so good. Counterparties are starting to look at this. Bond issuers, predominantly, I think it's important that you go, if you're issuing a green instrument, you should go with a bank that has green credibility. You shouldn't go with one of the guys at the bottom of the list because they are generally not as strong in their green franchise. This can become systemic as well, and this might be a little bit controversial, but if you look at the rolling sort of 12 months of green bond issuance, thank you EIB for this conference and for being the biggest green bond issuer. The second, the runner-up, is um, the uh, Saudi uh, Public Investment Fund, so the sovereign wealth fund of uh, the Saudi government. And they have issued slightly north of $8 billion of green bonds. And you can discuss, and we do that in our research, whether those should be eligible as green bonds or not. They're not issuing any other bonds. They are the second biggest owner of Saudi Aramco and they are a big investor in the Neom Giga project, and that might be especially controversial if you follow some of the human rights organizations. The problem here is that if you look on the right-hand side, uh, which banks have been on deals for PIF over the past 12 months, or been providing loans to PIF over the past 12 months? Everyone, except the two in the bottom. And that obviously creates a sort of a systemic dependency on one single issuer, which might, which might be controversial. So with that, I'll finish up and say um, you can, our research is free. It's available on the web. You can do that QR code, and they will send an email that sort of subscribes you automatically to it. I learned that function um, last night, and I think it's very cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ulf, and uh, thank you, Ulf, and thank you also, David, for setting the scene and setting the context for the next panel discussion we have, and also mentioning climate data, again, uh, debt and uh, fixed income instruments, which are essential in the next topic we'll be discussing, and that is achieving net zero. So, to the stage, I would like to invite um, the speakers and the moderator of the next panel, which will exactly focus on, on how to practically achieve net zero because we can always go and probably some of you may have and I sometimes go and Google okay so what exactly is net zero so the, in theory it does make sense and we know it's about reducing or finding the balance between the greenhouse gas emissions and how much we produce and how much we can actually absorb or remove but what exactly it means in practice and how does it look like to be in that net zero economy and also how do we get there and what is the role of banks in getting there so I thought people would be joining the stage while I speak, but it's not happening. So if I can please uh, invite to the stage Laura Negrisoyu, Strategic Project and Sustainability Director of Mazart, to moderate the discussion. And then uh, we'll start with Catherine Mintov, from, who's the head of EMEA um, Sustainability and ESG at Citibank. We have Tomasz Niewola, head of Structural Finance, co-head of Investment Banking at MBank. Professor Ben Caldeco, co-chair Global Research Alliance for Sustainable Finance and Investments, and of course, Gabriel Maroshi, Group Sustainability Officer 
at Erste Group. So the floor is yours. Enjoy the discussion. Thank you. And uh, I just wanted to, to say that, again, the dynamic of this event changed because the last uh, two speeches were about optimism. So we are going again up. <laughs> And um, also, in addition to, to the members of uh, the financial sector, I hope that also uh, people from the real economy, let's say, watched the last um, uh, speech because it's very important for them to understand also what is the trend in financing so that they can also adjust their policies. And um, let's say a more practical way that I read lately on thinking about climate change is about having in mind two figures. One, it's 51 billion, and second one is uh, zero. 51 billion represents the number of tons of greenhouse gas that are entering the atmosphere uh, every year. And uh, even if numbers can, um, can differ from time, to, from time to time, the general tendency is growth. And this is the stage that we are now. The second number is zero. And this is our, uh, <laughs> our objective. And uh, let's see practically how we can go there with the help of the, of the banks today. Uh, because in the end, the banks are making the, the link between the financial system and the real economy. So that's why it's extremely important to see how banks can actually contribute to this. So um, I will start with, uh, with Gabriel mm -hmm. <laughs> as a general question to see how uh, would be your approach to, to tackle the sustainability challenges. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to be on this panel. I, I think that we will have on this topic very interesting discussion. Um, I'm also happy, you know, that the banks are still enjoying so big trust that we should be an active player on the net zero transition. Although sometimes I have a feeling that we are not uh, really the players who can manage our own business. Um, but, uh, you know, just to just to relate back also what we have heard from, from David, and then this links very much to the understanding of what the banks can effectively do. Um, what, we are seeing, what, what we do see with the climate change is um, that basically our conditions are changing. Yeah? And the banks are primarily institutions who do understand you know, current opportunities and current risks. Um, now, what we are speaking about is that uh, if our risk profile is going to change in the future, we need to think in a completely different way. Yeah? So this is point number one, a big challenge for the banks, to look ahead and look for risks which today we don't see, we haven't seen them in the past, but we still need to start to deal with them. Point number two is that, um, that banks are typically you know, in, in a kind of a relationship business with their clients. That means that we have, we are operating in a certain region, we have there a certain set of clients, they have, a cert, they have certain operations, certain business model, and they are relying also very much on the policies of that markets, the governments and, and, and the, public, the public, public sentiment. So we cannot you know, just pick assets from the other side of the globe and, and, and shape our portfolio in a, in a very dynamic way. We need to think about how we can together with our clients make a change looking forward. And thirdly, usually the banks, you know, there is, I think that there is a kind of overly optimistic picture how much influence the banks can have on their clients. Yeah? I mean, we are providing service to our clients and our clients has a certain business model, you know, have a understanding where, they're, where, they, um, where they are heading to in the future. And the banks can a little bit shape it with fees, with negotiations, but we cannot change the complete business model of the clients. So, you know, taking these three things together and, and translating it into the net zero ambition and, uh, and, and uh, the, the kind of fair share of the impact what the banks should take out of this journey, 
I need to say that I am really surprised how many banks are taking how big commitments. Uh, uh, we, have, we have seen also um, a reference uh, to, the, to the UNEPIFA initiative, and we are part of the Net Zero Banking Alliance. Last year in October, there was uh, the annual report of this alliance stating that 60% of the banks are already taking interim commitments, so most, most, most uh, likely toward 2030, by how much they do see they commit to reduce the financed emissions. Now, you know, taking those three things, what I uh, just outlined from the banking, and taking, you know, the big commitment of the banking sector toward a net zero journey, I think, you know, this is a quite, quite ambitious stat status what the banks are building up. And it's still the easier part to make the commitment. The more difficult part is then, you know, to deliver on. And uh, from the ERSTE side, um, we, we spent basically two years to build up, firstly, our understanding where we are currently. Secondly, to, to build up a kind of understanding based on our clients, based on the financed assets, and based on our business model in the region of Central and Eastern European region, uh, how we can shift our, our kind of business uh, strategy going forward how we can motivate our existing stock of clients to make the transition happen. Yeah? And on that one, we just recently published our, our interim targets where we are stating that in the real estate sector, be it, in the si be it on the side of the retail or the corporate or, or the commercial real estate, we see that we can reduce the financed emissions nearly 40, 45%. In the energy sector, we do believe that together with our clients, and some of them yesterday were on, on, on panels, um, we can reduce the finance emission by 50%. And you know, these two sectors are at this moment, I do believe, the most important ones. They are the kind of early movers. So I'm happy that, uh, that finally, with all the thinking process involving all the countries, what we have, we were able to outline where the journey might happen in the portfolios of Erste, and we are, of course, building to that uh, engagement policies, products, and, and, and motivation schema also for the internal, uh, internal stuff as well. Okay, so your focus practically is on prioritizing sectors so that you get the biggest impact. The, um, to, to leverage on what you said about, uh, about risks, uh, what do you think, Katrin, about um, how banks are um, embedding risk, sustainability risks in their, uh, in their policies? Thank you. And, um, and thank you to Linda and the team for their excellent organization and for the opportunity to join you today. I guess um, the first thing I'd say for banks managing sustainability risks is that these are not new risks. Banks have been managing environmental and social risks to some extent for some time. But we know that climate change and biodiversity loss are accelerating and we're starting to see risks really materializing. Um, so there's still much more to do. When we think about how banks are exposed to risks, we're exposed usually indirectly across the whole economy uh, through our clients' activities. And we look to manage these risks. It's really important to think about two key things first. So we're clear on, on what we're trying to, to do to David's point earlier. So risk to who? Yes, we have to manage financial risk to the bank, as our regulators are increasingly asking us to do, but we also want to consider risk to society and the environment as well. So the, the, the second element of that, I guess, is for those risks that are risk to the bank, how do they manifest? So are they credit risks? Are they operational risks? Are they strategic risks? And the reason that's important is it informs how we integrate those, these relatively new emerging risks into the risk management machine that banking is, so the, the new issues. So banks can manage risks really at three different levels. So if you think of a sort of inverted pyramid, the, the basic building block is where banks are directly financing projects. So a real, a real economy asset like a mine or a railway. And there we can look at environmental and social impacts assessments to understand what are the risks at that location to 
a whole range of issues, water resources, biodiversity, communities. And then we can work with clients to support them in managing those risks through an action plan that can form part of the loan agreement. So the Equator Principles offers a framework for doing this, and, and many banks globally um, apply those principles, but it only applies to a few specific uh, um, transactions where banks are directly financing projects. So it's, it's, not, the, um, it's not the norm. Then next up from that um, is where we have um, uh, management of risks at the client level. So that can be where banks are lending to companies for general corporate purposes right across their lines of business, right across uh, the geographies that they're operating in. And there, that's a naturally much higher level assessment. We think about things like clients' commitment, capacity, and performance. Um, and so a couple of examples um, from City. Um, we have a climate risk assessment scorecard that we are um, using with our clients to try and build up an understanding of both transition and physical risks ac across our portfolios in key sectors. And the other is a net zero review template where we're really trying to deep dive into those transition plans um, in key sectors. So those are two separate things. Um, climate risk management on one hand and net zero inform each other. Um, they, are, uh, they are related, but they're not entirely the same thing. And then finally, at the portfolio level, that's where risk metrics um, come into play, our metrics and targets. I would say we're probably still at a relatively early stage in really understanding the full set of risk metrics that we need to manage new risks. Um, that's, a, that's very much a focus for us. Banks can use policies, so we have an environmental and social risk uh, policy framework that sets out um, for certain transactions uh, what is the review process? So, for example, um, we recently updated ours to inc include uh, review criteria for beef and soy production in Latin America. Um, and it also sets out our milestones for reducing our lending to the thermal coal mining sector. And then on the other hand, we've got our net zero targets. So we've set uh, net zero targets in six sectors, um, and we're working towards achieving those. In all of that kind of risk management work, I think foundations are really important and, and shouldn't be underestimated. So training, for example, um, is and will continue to be a really important part. We need bankers to be able to engage our clients and engage in a good conversation about risk opportunities um, and their transition plans. There are challenges, of course. I'm not going to even mention data. Um, but one of the challenges we find when thinking about transition plans is, is regional variation. So different countries have different energy needs. Um, and understanding um, the context of the, the region's development is really important and something that we're trying to capture in our transition uh, plans, in our transition review um, process. And secondly, that this is really ever-changing. So we're finding that expectations of regulators, um, what we're learning from our own analysis, really means that we're having to constantly shift our approach. You know, what a good transition plan looks like today is different to what a good transition plan looked like two years ago, and we expect that to continue evolving. So really, um, it's, a, it's an ever-growing exercise. And I'll just make two final points. Um, the first is on transparency. So we, we try to be really clear about why we are trying, how we're thinking and why, um, so that that helps um, investors and other consumers of our, um, our climate reports understand and interpret the results of where we're going, what, what, what's captured and what's not. Um, and secondly, just finally, I think in all of this, uh, we would be missing an opportunity if, if risk management was solely about risks. So one of, the, one of the key things we should use risk management for is also, yes, absolutely manage the risk, but also a platform for identifying opportunities for us to support client transition plans. Thank you. If, if, I, if I may just ask yeah. one question, because um, you know, the biggest challenge for us is the banking is done on calculated risk. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question would be, and, and to be honest, this, this is a kind of, uh, I, I haven't found for that a solution, how do you calibrate the climate-related risk? Because we don't really have, from the past, you know, a kind of relevant uh, observations. Mm -hmm. And as we heard, 
that the climate change is overriding the past. So how, how, how you are you doing that? Those are excellent questions. Um, so we, we are, um, I would, um, I think we're really building up our uh, capabilities on climate risk. So um, the US at the moment, the, um, the Fed has running a, a stress test, a, a first okay. stress test for the big US-based banks. Um, and so City is going for the first time through a global stress testing exercise. We've learned a little from participation in the ECB okay. exercise um, from Hong Kong. So really, I think, um, you know, this issue of how do you um, incorporate forward-looking risks when we can't look back at historical data to understand them is really being fleshed out now. Okay. okay. I think that if I understand, you are in the same shoes as we are. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, an interesting part is that you cannot kind of back testing. You are so used with back testing, mm-hmm. but for this risk, is hard to back te- te- uh, test. And also that your, let's say, care for what the clients are doing, uh, it's also directly, it's related to what is impacting you also. Because uh, depending where they are in their journey, it's where your portfolio is actually in your, <laughs> in your journey. So that's why it's so even important maybe to set the context so very well with the new customers, because at least here you can have an, um, an impact now. And to practically to leverage on the opportunities, because uh, that's an important part of uh, the ESG side, as if we just look at risks, we just think of costs and so on. But if we look at opportunities, the optimism rises again. So, um, so Tomas, if you can uh, detail us a bit how the, um, the market for the green or greener products looks like now. Sure. So, um, in fact, it was great to have this uh, presentation before about like a snapshot on how it looks from the global perspective and how the fixed uh, income market um, looks um, for green financing. I will try to put some context um, from the regional perspective because it's a C uh, summit. So, um, first of all, I think that uh, what, what is very visible is that from the product perspective, um, there are basically at this stage all products that are necessary. It's, it's not an issue of the product. The, the issue is about really allocate the funding to the right places to, to achieve the impact. Because when I compare large deals and smaller deals, and smaller deals in our regions are crucial to, to really have this transition impact, um, those are two completely different words. When we have been as M-Bank um, issuing our green bond, that was um, a very big success. We have tapped uh, the global market. We have 80% of ESG uh, investors. But if, when, when we look at the geographical um, division between them, it's basically UK, France, um, Scandinavian countries. There was less than 10% uh, of investors from the region. And then if we go down the scale, and we look at deals not of the like 500 million euro size, but 20 million euro, 100 million euro. And then, because we are issuing a number of green bonds uh, in this uh, scale, then it's extremely difficult to attract ESG investors to this market because it's too small, too far away, doesn't fit the allocation uh, criteria in, in, in many portfolios. And then that's really the, the, the place when we need more funding and uh, where the funding really makes uh, a lot of impact. So, so I believe it's not about the products. Products are there. It's more about finding a way to attract the capital really to, to the places where when, uh, the impact is really realized. And then I will react a little bit to your um, comment because you are not that optimistic about the impact of banks on, on, on the client uh, in respect to carbon footprint and, and overall strategy. And um, 
I may be slightly more optimistic on uh, on that. I really believe the impact is not going through the, this like few margin difference on uh, ESG alone uh, and whether the targets are achieved uh, or not. That's very important, and, and and really that's like a real proof of uh, of the fact that those structures are, are working. But I really believe in the impact which goes through like everyday meetings with clients and then meeting them uh, one day and then six months earlier and then coming back to the fact last time we discussed about your green strategy, what was the impact, what is your strategy, when you will have the exact data on your carbon footprint, what are your strategy in respect to the reduction, when will it start, what are the results, and really this like constant pressure this is something which I believe is, is the main channel to, to realize the impact on, on the client. And, and for banks, that, that's extremely important because M Bank and, and many other banks have already net um, zero pledges. And then, of course, it's still far away. It's 2014, 2015, uh, 15. Uh, so, so it's like quite a long perspective. But at the same time, there's and an enormous work to do, because our clients, majority of them today, they are not even able to calculate the, fo the footprint. So, the, and, and there will be very difficult decision at some stage in the banking sector. Yeah, there will be decision, very tough decisions at the credit committee's level of, of type, uh, this is our long-term client, we've been working for 20 years now, and then they are not delivering on, uh, on the transition. They are not delivering on the reduction of, of carbon footprint. What do we do? Do we increase pressure uh, and, and still keep them on, the, on, on our books? Or at some stage, there, there will be a tough decision to just um, quit this, this relationship. And um, it's not today. Probably it's, we are not there yet. But this is how it will wor work in a couple of years' time. And, uh, and that's why I believe banks are the key, one of the key elements of, uh, of transition. May I just very shortly react? So don't take it wrong. I am I'm optimistic and you can see it on the Erste profile. We are going ahead and I think in, 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 some, some, in, in some extent we are, you know, setting the trend in the CE region. Nevertheless, look in the region if we are, you know, just counting how many banks in the region already disclosed their ambition, their targets until 2030 you will find that this is way more than 60%. Almost all the big banks in the region already have certain target setting. Point number one. Point number two, look how many companies are setting targets. If you, if you just check you know, the sites of the Science-Based Target Initiative, in Austria there is 31 companies who set targets, in Czech Republic two, in uh, Slovakia zero, in Hungary, I think also two, and in Romania, zero. Huh? So, you know, what I'm saying is at this moment, the banks are much more progressive than the companies, sure. and the banks are much more progressive than the sovereigns as well. Because uh, just look, you know, how much kind of public information the sovereigns, you know, our governments are putting available on a yearly basis, how they are progressing on their carbon footprint. Where are the targets? What they are doing? You know, uh, this is what I'm saying, that banks can do a lot, and we are putting in a lot of effort, and we are setting ambitions, and I do believe that we are setting the trend. But we need that all the, all the rest of the society is following. And even I would expect that some part of the society, like the government, should take the leadership, right? So fully, fully agree, we are, we are, we are on a good way. Mm -hmm. So, in conclusion, also we have like two pillars on like pressure for the for the companies is like the also the, the regulators because they, they impose them to report through especially in Europe through CSRD in the near future and also you as banks through your pledges you will have to pressurize your clients so that you can respect your commitments because without them not reducing their impact, you will not be able to also reduce, to respect your pledge. And to be even, to, to go to even more practical aspects, I would like to ask um, Ben, what is your experience in how companies are um, implementing their net zero strategies? 
Yeah, thank you for that question and thank you for the kind invitation to, to be part of this panel. So what I wanted to do was really to build off Catherine's remarks and talk a bit about transition plans and transition planning because that underpins transition finance, which so many of the speakers have spoken about already. Two quick plugs, though, before I do, um, partly because Ulf and David set those up so nicely. So we actually have a conference on natural language processing and sustainable finance in Oxford on the 19th of July. And we also have a conference on fixed income and engagement and net zero also in Oxford on the, um, the uh, 19th of June. So if you're interested in those things, do, do come along. Um, but tra transition plan, so, and transition planning, transition finance. So we have this context where, and you were just saying this, a very large number of commitments from financial institutions, less so from corporates in this region, but that's not, not necessarily the case everywhere. Um, great. Uh, how do we make sure those actually um, become real and that these companies in the real economy or, the, or financial services firms actually change what they're doing. And there's a sense that it's very easy to make these promises and that firms that have made these commitments are not fulfilling those commitments. And there's sort of growing evidence to suggest that, um, that there are quite a few institutions that aren't, aren't backing up um, words with, with uh, what action, backing up their words with action. Um, so how can we resolve this? How can we make sure that um, their commitments are credible? Uh, and, and this is something that is a, is a very live issue. Um, it's, it's live from a conduct greenwashing regu regulatory perspective. Um, obviously, civil society organizations are very concerned. Wider society is very concerned. Um, and the answer is these credible transition plans. Um, and we need to make sure that uh, companies that have made commitments have ambitious targets. They have credible strategies. They have appropriate accountability and governance mechanisms in place and that they have transparent and robust metrics to, to track progress. And in many cases, those things do not, do not exist. Um, so a couple of jurisdictions, as well as some international processes, have been um, calling for the introduction of transition plans. In the UK, for example, um, it's currently a, a requirement on a comply or explain basis to prepare a net zero transition plan. The government in March in the UK announced that it was going to make that a requirement for large companies, so a net zero transition plan. Transition plans look set to feature in the International Sustainability Standards Board and um, their standards that are going to be finalized next month. You have um, GFANS uh, has got working groups on transition plans. You have IOSCO and the NGFS and the FSB all looking at how transition plans can be introduced in different jurisdictions in different ways covering off um, different types of security. Um, and I think one of the, the, the things that's coming through in this work on transition plans is the need not only for companies to think about how they can prepare for an economy-wide transition to net zero, but how they can also contribute positively to it. So that means having a plan to manage the risks and catch the opportunities of the transition, but also demonstrating very clearly how you can support the transition in the jurisdictions you, you operate in. And that's actually quite a different way of thinking about, about all of this. So when we think about banking and how banks can make a difference, well, where do they operate? What sectors do they lend to? How can they help transform those sectors? What is their strategy for doing so? It's not just about providing a few more loans um, to slightly cleaner companies. Uh, I think there's a sort of more expansive, more interesting, more strategic way of thinking about these things and developing theories of change and thinking about the levers at your disposal in different bits of the world to make a difference. Um, I think transition plans are going to underpin quite a few things that have already been mentioned. They will be used in sustainability-linked structures. Um, they will obviously, I think, also determine um, access to capital through the banking system. You know, banks will be more inclined to lend at a lower cost of capital to companies that have a credible transition plans. Um, they will drive stewardship and engagement activities, including in the banking sector. And actually, that's one of, one of the, the key levers, actually, for encouraging the transition within banking and the role of banking within the transition is stewardship and engagement of, of, of and with the banking sector. Um, transition plans will be used by supervisors, um, particularly in microprudential regulation, but also there'll be conduct issues that I alluded to before. 
Um, this will drive policy. You'll see policymakers going, well, we, we only want to support companies that have credible transition plans. So we will allocate subsidy in that way. We will create regulations that support those companies that have transition plans. We will increase burdens on those companies that don't have transition plans. We'll start to see that. Um, and I think this will also drive future litigation and liabilities as well. You know, did you as a company or a board have a transition plan where you should have had one? Um, and I expect uh, a lot of those legal actions to, to begin. We're also going to see, and we're seeing this in the UK context through this transition plan task force that's been set up to kind of define what good looks like for transition plans. It's not just about net zero. Um, so increasingly, this conversation will be about adaptation. What are your adaptation plans? How are you going to become more resilient and support wider societal resilience to climate change? And also nature recovery, biodiversity. Um, how can you, again, manage the risks uh, associated with ecological dependencies, but how can you also support nature recovery? Um, one other thing I wanted to mention in terms of how um, banks can support uh, decarbonisation and, and things we could do to, to enable banks to do more is exploring open banking standards in this space. So one of the issues is sort of alluded to, but not said explicitly, is that, you know, banks are, are going to find it difficult to ask their clients for an awful lot of information. Um, and that's one of the things that's preventing them from probably doing more. And so if you have open banking standards where information can flow more freely, where clients don't have to prepare different disclosures for different banks, that they, there's a common way of disclosing information, then that unlocks competition. Banks can different banks can see the same information and go, OK, well, we can use that to provide this transition finance package for you. Oh, no, well, we can provide a better transition finance package for you, and you have competition in the market. The, the same as with the financial data. There are no well, different sets of financial in, data for different in, banks. Indeed. <laughs> and there's another aspect to, to that OTA, to kind of sharing more information, which is these sustainability-linked instruments, particularly sustainability-linked loans. If you come up with a structure with a KPI and, it, and it's rubbish, you're not going to share that information with anyone. Similarly, if you're a bank and you find a great one, you're probably going to hold it on, keep it to yourself, keep it close to your chest. In fact, what we need is for really effective KPIs and structures to be adopted widely across the, the sector, and that's going to require sharing information that isn't currently happening. Thank you. Um, and to actually point out on your mention about uh, transition, because through taxonomy, the, the regulators try to define what sustainability means and what a sustainability company means. So how, in this year, all the companies some that are reporting on um, non-financial regulation, they have to report also their taxonomy alignment um, indicators. How would you see that in your clients? How will you use that data uh, from, from your clients that are already preparing that kind of information. Especially from the capital perspective, because one of the indicators is also how much capex is sustainable in total capex. Will that be in, uh, an information that you'll use it? If okay, if, if I may start. So, Firstly, I so much like these taxonomy-related uh, disclosures because I do believe that there is an enormous amount of information in them. Now, of course, for us as, 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 as banks, uh, the primary use of this information is to complete our reporting, right? Whatever our customers are reporting, we need to translate it to the financing of the customer and through the financing then into our reporting how much of our uh, so-called green asset ratio uh, mm -hmm. is, is, is then uh, reaching by the year end. But that's, to be honest, a reporting exercise. And this is important for our investors, for the regulators, for the public. But most importantly, I do believe that in the information from the taxonomy reporting, we, we can read out a little bit, you know, what is the intention of the company, how much they are going to invest into green technologies how much they are going to invest at all. Um, but I need to confess um, that the bankers are, are, are doing a business which is typically much more simple than to, to use all the, the available information. And the taxonomy is something very new. Yeah? So it's still a way to go that the bankers are integrating into their assessment of the client, the taxonomy related information, not just to you know, assess the risks, but also to assess the opportunities. 
And this is, to be honest, a quite long process. Um, I, I mean, the group sustainability officer in Erste, in Erste is sitting in the credit committee. And I many, time, many times asking my, uh, my colleagues from the business side, so um, what was the reporting of the client on the taxonomy eligibility last year? How much you expect out of you know, the client's CAPEX, OPEX turnover to be green? And at this moment, this information is not yet in the DNA of the business side of the banks. Yeah? And then let's, let me make here one more thought uh, for, for the discussion and I'm then giving over the, the, the talk to, to the other colleagues here. Um, the taxonomy is one part of the story. What I'm really looking forward is with the CSRD, the obligation to explain how the companies and the institutions are aligning their business strategy to the 1.5 degree climate scenario. Because the 1.5 degree is a very challenging scenario. And again, turning back, you know, the wheel a little bit, the governments are not committing to 1.5 degree scenario. But we as institutions, we as companies, we are obliged, obliged to explain how we are going to reach the 1.5 degree scenario. Okay, I'm handing over to the colleagues, maybe some other thoughts are coming on that. Yeah, if, if I may just go back to the, the point on taxonomies for a second. Um, one of, I, I, I think the, ta the EU taxonomy is a, an amazing, astonishing piece of work. And, um, you know, we know there are um, issues being raised around the usability of it. And it was good to hear yesterday um, that that is, is a focus, is what, what will the impact be? Um, I think one of the challenges for international organizations is understanding how we can, yes, we have to use the taxonomy to report um, in our EU entities, uh, but how we can use that as a tool when it's applicable in one market and there are other national taxonomies being developed all over the world and how we try and think about building a system where we can both report and <coughs> identify opportunities in quite a fragmented um, landscape. So that's a concern. Um, so, you know, like many of our peer banks, we have a sustainable finance goal. Um, and we've, by, by necessity, we have to define quite broad criteria for that. Um, for us, that includes both finance and facilitation. And, and we, we deliberately made it broad because we wanted to engage as many parts of our organization as we possibly could. Um, so how uh, country and regional taxonomies will interact with, you know, and be interoperable to define um, kind of a more global standard is a, is a really important concern. Yeah, that will be a very big uh, It would be a very big scheme. scheme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank yes, you. So, so just one more quick comment on this, yeah. because effectively it's not natural right now for the companies to report uh, taxonomy capex uh, uh, in the overall capex. Uh, it really requires initiative and, and then additional questions from, uh, from the side of the financial institutions, and um, this is happening. But I would get back one for, for a second uh, to, to one very important point, which are, which are those standards, yeah, because we are working with SBTI, with PCAF, and so on, but it's extremely important at some stage to, to set the standard for everyone, because otherwise there will be no way for, for corporates to, to really do this job. This, this is an amazing, uh, huge work on the back side to fight and uh, to create teams, to learn pe to, to teach people, to, to really implement this in, in, in the bank. And then for corporates, which often have like smaller structures and then less um, committed or, or I would say less uh, focus on, on, on those sustainability issues, it is really crucial to make it as smooth and as practical for them as, uh, as possible um, having uh, common standards. Thank you. And regarding data, because uh, again, how you, you mentioned, it's a challenge to get the right data. Ben, maybe you can uh, develop on this from your experience. What are the main aspects to be considered here? What are the main aspects to be considered in relation to climate change data and banking? God, there's a, that's a big question. There's a lot there. Um, look, I mean, I think they're, they're sort of 
Two, 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 two points. So one is um, one thing we've been doing a lot of work on um, for you know, I don't know five, six, seven years now is, is really focused on asset level geolocated data. And, um, and if, you can, if you can have consistent global asset level data sets tied to ownership information, that allows you to do all sorts of very cool stuff um, in relation to different kinds of climate risk, different types of environmental risk, understanding externalities, understanding impact, impact attribution, um, uh, all sorts of things. And that's, that's, that's kind of missing in many sectors. So it's really important that we address that requirement. Um, we're doing that at Oxford in co coalition with others for, for high impact, as in very polluting sectors of the global economy, iron and steel, cement, pulp and paper, these sorts of things, petrochemicals, creating these open asset level data sets. So we kind of need a, a, an endeavor to do that systematically and quickly, <coughs> and we can do that. And that's partly enabled by developments in technology that David kind of alluded to, but I'm thinking particularly around earth observation, machine learning. Um, so that's point one. Um, and I, by the way, I think policymakers are just not being sufficiently ambitious in that, that, that area. They can step up and organize something very quickly, but they haven't. They've been wasting a lot of time on things that are much less impactful than solving that, that data requirement. Um, second point is, uh, again, building on David's uh, opening contribution. Um, there are these sort of two families of, of approaches that, that do overlap. So there's natural language processing, and then there's this earth observation machine learning thing that I mentioned before. So um, we're very excited about ChatGPT and all those, all those applications. Um, there are a lot of kind of ESG startups, innovators working on both tracks. Um, and, and I think that's really exciting. So keep an eye on both those sort of those, those tracks of development and innovation. Um, and I think we're also seeing more generally uh, actually a lot of the innovations we're seeing in the climate sustainability space around data and finance have applications well beyond sustainability and finance, right? They've, they've become useful for understanding risk and return just generally for different sectors. So I think if you're a financial institution, it's worth kind of thinking about, well, if you, if you want to have cutting edge capabilities that can help you figure out risk and return in different sectors just generally, it probably makes sense for you to sp spend some time in understanding developments in sustainability data and analytics, because actually that's where a lot of the innovation is coming, coming from. Okay, thank you. And um, to continue with the data, because as we were saying, it's one of the biggest challenges. Maybe, Catherine, you can detail what were your lessons learned from the past years regarding uh, data that, at the global level. That's a big topic. Um, and, you know, my colleagues who are at crunching numbers on net zero could probably talk on this for days. But I think one of the, you know, the, the, the most often cited um, is the availability of data. So we know that clients, uh, you know, my data science colleagues would tell you that there's only about 3,500 companies globally that are disclosing greenhouse gas emissions. And that's a, a reasonably basic disclosure. Um, so, um, you know, we follow um, the PCAF methodology for estimating our data quality when we're calculating um, our net zero baseline and progress against it. And that is improving over time, uh, which is good, but there's a really a long way to go. Um, and um, we're sort of trying to fly the plane while we're building it, in, to use a really terrible analogy, um, because our baseline will improve um, as, we're, as we're moving, as we get more disclosed data from clients. I think, and, and, and the UK regulator has been quite clear on this, that you know, banks have a role in helping uh, our clients to take that first initial step um, by opening a conversation, by engaging with clients. Um, quite often, our focus has been on the carbon intensive sectors, but that's something that needs to happen right across the economy. Um, so I think as a sector, we need to get much better at helping companies just get started. Um, I think financial products and services have a, have a role to play in that, but also relationships and conversations between clients and their bankers on um, expectations of disclosure and how people can move forward. And of course, CSRD will have a huge impact in the next couple of years. Thank you. 
me also bring here a thought. Um, I think that we are still, you know, experiencing the easier part of the data challenge because we are just, you know, starting to or trying to establish the starting point. We are using uh, also proxy informations like using, you know, emission factors from the PCAP database. But the challenge is different. If the banks are committing to reduce 50% of their financed emissions by 2030, which is in eight years' time, that means that on the yearly level, they need to report 6% reduction yeah, annually. I mean, and that update of the information that the client made the investment, what was the impact of the investment? So how, how is my position changing? This is something which will be a kind of major challenge, what I see, because that means that we are not, you know, collecting one-time information, but we need to ask the client to regularly update us on the progress of his investments. And this we need to start also already now, because, you know, we are already experiencing the first year of the transition, next year, then second year. So, um, you know, this, this data challenge, and I, I, I also would like to, you know, just give this information to the audience, because uh, many of the companies are sitting here as well. Please be patient with the banks. We need to see what you are, how you are progressing, and I do believe that this will be to your benefit as well, because ultimately what we are doing is we are trying to accelerate the transition, trying to put it in a, you know, in a track, and hopefully with that, we are reducing the risks and with the reduce, reduced kind of risk positions, we should sooner or later be able to reflect it into the pricing as well. I have completely the opposite advice for people in the room. <laughs> which is really accelerate the pressure on the banks and up the pace. Um, and there's, there's a lot more that can be done, I think, very, very quickly. Um, so, and, and, and some of this is, is, is regulatory as well. You know, we've fantastic progress on the climate stress tests, you know, the exploratory stress tests that have got supervised firms to really think about this stuff and build up capabilities. And we've just got to make sure that that momentum isn't lost, that these exploratory one-off stress tests become recurring. And um, that, that's one way, and there are many ways, but that's one way in which pressure on the banking sector can, can accelerate and then speed up what you guys are doing. Yeah. So yeah. My, my point on, on this would be we don't need more pressure, but we don't need less pressure. <laughs> we, we, we don't need to, to ask um, an additional uh, patience. The, the level of pressure is just right, and banks are really doing a lot. Uh, the, 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 the pressure now, I think it's more on the corporate side, uh, j just to help them to fit within what we need on the, on the bank side. Yeah? So that's, uh, I believe, um, banks are properly motivated to, to do the right thing, I believe. Pressure's just right. Sounds like <laughs> you need to crank it up. OK, I, I think that the better word is the challenge, right? Um, and, 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 and to be honest, the, the, the kind of rising level of, of, of challenges is, is, is something what I, I do believe that at some point in time, will bring um, a very kind of good understanding also of the policymakers yeah? that to live up to these commitments, i.e. to facing the challenges in a credible way, uh, we, we need to join, join our forces. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So it's like um, now we are in a general consent that we are still in a transition period for everyone with data, for banks, for corporates, for everyone. But soon the pressure will increase, how, how you said, from all the perspectives, from the uh, regulators, from the society, and hopefully on the banks and from the banks. <laughs> I would be more concrete. To be honest, 2024 is something what ECB declared that they do expect that the banks are fully complying with the gui guidelines on the climate and environmental risk management, right? So we are in, in the midterm to the compliance period of, of or, or expectation of ECB. And uh, just, you know, again, relating to the discussion what we have had yesterday, at this moment, 60% of the banks are dealing in a kind of sound and, and well-progressed way with the ECB expectations. So 40% is still at the beginning but the ultimate horizon of the expectation is 2024. So that is, uh, that is, you know, the magnitude of the challenge. 
And I do believe that the transition risk, uh, as, as Catherine mentioned, the, the physical risks uh, are still kind of topics which the bank need to, banks need to digest, need to frame, and need to be able also to calculate and calibrate. Yeah? So that, that's one part, and the other part is, of course, how they are living up to the net zero challenges. And I also do see here some questions coming in. Okay. Uh, the last question from me, and then we can go also there to the screen. Um, do you think, because we are talking about risks, do you think there should be a higher capital requirement on brown firms? Or contrary, would you agree with an easier capital requirements on the green assets? Let me guess what a bunch of bankers are going to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the reasoning is the important, you know. Uh, and, uh, what's and, the reasoning then? And if I may, I, I, I you know, um, I have had yesterday a very interesting discussion on that, uh, also involving uh, Martin Spoltz. And uh, my point is, you know, if you are putting a brown penalization factor, you are slowing down the thing. If you are putting in a green kind of premium factor, you are accelerating the transition. Yeah? So for me, the choice is very, very easy. The green is you know, a positive motivation. And this is what we see in the competition of Europe and the US. That was the discussion yesterday in the evening. US is putting in you know, motivating forces to accelerate their transition. In Europe, we should do the same. Tomas, what is your? I believe you're absolutely right. Banks would be for like positive stimulation rather than for uh, penalization um, with um, capital ratios. But uh, at the same time, I believe um, this like some kind of premium for green assets. This is something we, we, we see already, yeah? and I believe as well. This is something which works already quite uh, quite well. I believe today there is no issue of uh, financing green energy, green assets in um, in CE. Of course, if there is an issue, it's uh, issue related to to the stability of the regulatory landscape, and and that's the main issue. Yeah, it's not. Uh, I believe the issue of the banks not willing to to finance green economy. Uh, at least what what I see um, on on my side, banks are really willing to to finance all green uh, projects without. Um, like excessive additional uh, simulation. So I, I mean, I, I agree with that. I, I, I don't think there should be um, subsidy through risk weightings for green assets. I do think it's a risk-based framework, and using that lens, you can apply. Um, it, I think it would be justifiable for there to be um, additional capital charges on polluting assets if they if you demonstrate they were riskier. And, it, and, and by risky, there are two things, right? Riskier for the lender, but riskier, that they generate risks for society as well, right, through creating climate change and contributing to global warming. So I think we, we, should, be thinking, we should be thinking about those two types of risk when we're thinking about adjusting capital requirements. But to your point, there's also, a, and this is also one of the questions here, in a sense, um, you know, we need, we need more nuance here, you know, particularly if you're thinking about you know, most companies, most economic activities are polluting. So how can we support the transition of those things and, um, and a kind of a crude green, red, green, brown, whatever you want to call it, is, um, is, is, is not actually the right way to think, think about this stuff. And, you know, when you're lending money to a polluting company, you should be going, well, do they have a credible transition plan? And if they do, then, a, there might be a good case for us to provide the capital for you to transition, but not every company is going to be able to transition. And so we need to be honest about that with ourselves. At the moment, everyone is saying, oh, yeah, you've got a transition plan. Everyone can transition. Hell, yeah, we can lend to anyone. But no, I'm afraid not, not everyone's going to, going to survive this. Yeah. Uh, let, let me come back just for one thought on the argumentation on the, on the you know, capital charge, the risk and, and the risk, risk position of, of, of this whole story. Um, if, you know, we are taking into consideration the society and risk, what, what you mentioned as well, and considering a brown penalization factor, I mean, we cannot, you know, disconnect the brown assets unless we have a green alternative. We are just increasing with that the transition risk. So, you know, from the risk, pos risk position and, and especially the transition risk position, um, I think it would be very justifiable at first, you know, to build up the green assets, and then the brown assets anyway becoming obsolete. Yeah? So here I, I, I think that there is a good reasoning to, to apply the green 
premium rather than the brown uh, kind of penalization. Catherine, if you want to add something. Um, I completely agree with Ben um, that it should be on a risk basis. So, um, you know, I mean, we would argue for um, global consistency, as we always do. Um, I think we're still at a relatively premature stage of understanding risks, you know, in some some sectors, some subsectors, maybe some clients in some subsectors, we expect the financing needs to go up, so capital to go up, not, not down. Um, so I think it just needs to be a carefully evidence and risk-based decision. Okay, thank you. Just can I ask, do you agree that a disruptive change, you know, just phasing out all the coal power plants without having the energy sources to replace it. Do you agree that this is increasing the transition risk? Yeah, absolutely. That's a disorderly transition, right? Exactly. So, yeah. so um, energy security, access to energy is, of course, going to be of premium importance to government, governments and communities. So, yeah, our objective here is a smooth transition, right? Good. But then, you know, the brown penalization factor, which would effectively lead, you know, lead to a kind of early phase out of the high polluting assets, including the coal power plant, right? Would just increase the risk as kind of systemic risk on the energy market. No, I mean, no, no? no, no one's saying we're going to switch off the lights. So don't straw man uh, us. The, well, I, I disagree, but anyway, should we have some questions yeah. in the audience? <laughs> okay. So um, the first uh, question, we kind of discussed about it, but does pledging to net zero make sense at all? It's not possible without offsetting, but these projects are often questionable. Yeah, so if, if I may, maybe two, two words to, to that, because we don't have much time, but... Yeah. And we discussed already a lot about the carbonization of the credit portfolio, because that's the main challenge, and that, that's uh, the most difficult part. But I believe uh, there is value as well in, in the fact that banks are giving a good example on, on their own uh, emission reduction, scope one, scope two, because this is something which are, as well that they can show to their clients and somehow um, and it's not very difficult for banks, yes, because it's just electrify the fleet, buy green energy, and then take care of your real estate assets. It's not an incredible effort, but uh, it's a very good example uh, shown to, to the clients. Thank you, Tomas. And uh, the second question, because we don't have too much time. Have the banks on the panel used the mortgage portfolio standard to manage the climate and transition risks in their mortgage lending? If you, if you used, not that I'm aware of, no. No, no, definitely not this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to just um, add something else about uh, transition risks, because it's the the third question there. How do you manage the transition risk for? Maybe, Catherine, you can reinforce summarize at the end? Yeah, I think, well, it's a traditional risk management process. So it's identify the risks, measure them, try and understand them, try and um, dimension them out, um, put your metrics in place. Um, and critically, for thinking about transition risk, have that feedback loop back, back into strategy. I think we can be very focused at the moment on understanding the risks and, and, and being asked to do um, the, you know, asked to enact the regulatory requirements, but it's, but it's also that feedback to what, what does the bank do differently? What extra capacity do we need to build as a result? Okay, thank you. And um, a, a question okay. for the last one <laughs> for Erste. Is Erste planning to finance brown assets for as long as possible and it's expecting not to be penalized for that? Okay, let me take this one because to keep the lights on. I see. I see that I, you know, I, I see that I, I made here too many kind of provocative questions. Um, but uh, listen, I mean, uh, Erste is definitely not financing those companies who are not making the transition, and I can I can say that very kind of openly. We have had a couple of transactions in a size of hundreds of millions of euros. What we turned down on the credit committee because they were toward companies who did not 
commit you know, to a transition. And we have such a companies here in, in Czech Republic who are even investing into new coal assets. And, and, and on, on, on such a companies, we have a very clear policy of, of uh, you know, not engaging. So that's very clear for us. Uh, the, the, what I, I tried here to argue was rather the sense of the things what we are doing and the order of the steps what we need to take in the transition. Um, and, and on that one, I, I have a very clear opinion that uh, the green investments would need to have some kind of benefits because simply, and especially in the SME segment, the clients don't understand still why they should invest into green. And the banks today have very limited opportunities to offer benefits to the clients huh, to motivate them for their own sake of investment. Huh? And again, just really underlining what is on the question, we are not dedicatedly financing brown assets and we are not engaging with those customers who do not want to make the transition out of the brown assets as such. Yeah. Thank you, Gabriel. And we are out of time. So thank you so much for this uh, practical discussion. And uh, I guess let's have lunch now. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much, Laura. Exactly. So it is time for lunch, and thank you for the for the very frank and very lively discussion. That's uh, I think we are still, you could say, at the beginning of the transition. But it's really nice to see some positive outlook and some also some desire to collaborate and actually to share knowledge and share practices. Because whether we, I mean, I think we all agree that it will only accelerate these discussions and the challenges and some of these things will very much materialize. I think as we go on. And with this in mind, I do invite all of you to join us for lunch. And thank you once again, all the speakers and moderators for, the, for this panel discussion.